winning side, a wonderful, wonderful thing that is. I feel like, you know, I don't know what's going on upstairs in floor two. I feel like I should do what I used to see years and years ago on television when they had news flashes. And then they say, we now join tonight's program in progress, is what they do. Of course, they missed the main theme of the program, so at that point, it's pointless. And so anyway, glad to have you here tonight. We're going to begin with a word of prayer. And God is answering prayer, by the way. Some of you, you get a, get a list of prayer requests a mile long from me. But, I mean, God is answering those. I, I want you to know that. And, and I'll, I'll, share, I'll share some of the answers I can now. I'll share some of the answers I can later. Uh, but God is answering prayer. It's a wonderful thing. So let's have a word of prayer. Ask God's blessing on the service. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for this wonderful time that we can gather in your name and that we can look ahead to the week and know that you will be with us during the week. And we look to you tonight, and we know that you are with us tonight. And we think of uh, friends and fellow believers and loved ones. And yes, Lord, in, in your presence, that you are and, and will be with them too. And so we acknowledge our responsibility before you to meet you uh, on our knees and to beseech you on behalf of so many things that are taking place because of all the answers anybody could have you have the best ones and so help us look to you tonight as we praise you and as we look into your word in jesus name amen, amen. and you may be seated i am so thankful for brother jim guru uh being a song leader I mean, we've got one song leader out of town, another song leader is, is sick, and I mean, I, I'd, I'd be fourth string song leader. I'd rather, have, I'd rather have somebody higher up the chain lead songs, so Brother Jim's doing that tonight. Thankful for that. Brother Jim, get us started again. Okay, 378, the Haven of Rest, 378. First now. <laughs>
wonderful to have answers to prayer and uh, glad. I'm glad to know that most of the time when people get sick, they get better. I, I really do like that. I'm glad for that. And so we have some people who have been ill and they're in the process of recovering and recovering is always a good thing. And sometimes when we go to a doctor, we just want an answer. And so when a doctor provides an answer, that's really an answer. We go, praise the Lord. Now I know what's going on. Wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. How many pills do you have to take? You said they're, the, they're horse pills? Mm, okay. Can I chew them? No, bad flavor? Okay. Um, what can I take them with? Okay, can I take them with lasagna? Um, you know, different things like that. And uh, anyway, so grateful for that and uh, grateful for answers. Here's, a, here's an answer. Some of you this morning, you were praying because we, we have a, uh, a couple in our church and they're on the love boat right now. And so, I mean, they're, they're suffering at the port of, in Costa Rica, terrible, terrible place to be, you know, shouldn't be there. But uh, anyway, so uh, they, they um, uh, you know, our dear brother officiated uh, a service this morning and they're expecting 50. Well, the room maxed out at 67 and, uh, or 63, I should say, and then they spilled out into the hallway. And so they probably had about 70. There was one lady after the service uh, was over that uh, said to our dear brother in Christ, said, said, to me, this is the highlight of the entire cruise. And so anyway, God's working on that. Continue to pray for them. They have two more Bible studies. I mean, they, I mean they're making us feel totally unspiritual. They're having two Bible studies a week on the boat. And, uh, and so they'll have, uh, they'll have, they'll be both 8.30 in our time zone on Tuesday and Thursday, but God is doing a work and praise the Lord for that. And um, anywhere we're grateful for, you know, representation. We had some representatives, I guess the, uh, the Republican Party had, they established their platform this weekend and and one of the ladies became the head of the prayer team of the whole thing. When she walked in, she just walked in to pray. And they said, okay, you're the president of the prayer team. I mean, it's called, you know, uh, you ascension by assassination, okay? You become president pro tem or speaker pro tem or something pro tem the moment you walk in the door. But anyway, we praise the Lord for all the hard work uh, that they're doing. So let's talk about this week again. And uh, that, let me talk about, uh, we have... Uh, two care center ministries, two care center ministries. Uh, one will be Subtle Care, that'll be at 3.30 p.m. Uh, on Tuesday, we have Mackay Creek, 12.45 p.m. And uh, let, me, let me say this, we've been doing a little bit of juggling. We've been kind of moving and weaving because of illness. And so you're going, and I don't believe anybody would ever need my help there. Uh, this week would be a good week for you to show up if you wanted to help. This particular week would be a great week. And so anyway, just uh, letting you know uh, that that is going on. We do, have, we do have soul winning this weekend. We have men's prayer at 8.30, ladies prayer at 9 o'clock, and then we have all church soul winning, and that'll be at 10 o'clock. And, and I'm here to tell you, and isn't it wonderful? The fall weather is made to order. So all of a sudden, we are going down below freezing, highs in the 40s, you're going to go, this feels just right for this time of year. Here it comes. And so anywhere ready for that, um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the little squeals coming from my cucumber and tomato plants when that hits. And so I'm going to have to go out there and harvest quickly. But uh, anyway, uh, enjoy that beautiful weather again. We are going to have a junior age hay maze, and that'll be on Thursday, uh, Thursday, November 2nd. I think I have my dates right on that. Pretty sure I'm okay on that, uh, letting you know that. And what we will do, we have, we have grades one through six. We have anybody kindergarten on down. We might ask mom and dad to come because if they have a meltdown in the maze or get scraped by one of Brother Glenn Miller's Canadian thistles, uh, we want to know mom or dad might be there to just give them a little bit of comfort. So just uh, making mention, but we're going to have a fabulous time with that, letting you know we do have Brian Brunch next Sunday morning, and we have men's preaching next Sunday night. I mean, I had a couple men this week, and they were in sackcloth and ashes because they thought, I'm not ready 
tonight. I'm not going to get it done in time. I said, it's not tonight. It's next Sunday night. So anyway, we're going to have a fabulous, fabulous time. Looking forward to that. Uh, so thankful for those that are in the choir right now. We had our first choir rehearsal, and uh, we are now on our way, and we're practicing choir anthems. We're practicing anthems even for the Christmas holiday. And so we're looking forward to that. And then starting next week in junior church, a lot of the singing time is going to change because we're getting ready now for the Christmas program. And so, I mean, that is a yearly event. Uh, I look forward to it. The only time in our, the only time once a year in our church where cookies show, cookies show up in the foyer. And I know some of you'd like to make that a vote, have a business meeting, say, hey, can we have cookies in the foyer every Sunday? Well, we don't have that but we do uh, about a full week before Christmas, and so that will take place. Oh, yeah, speaking of business meetings, thank you, Brother Jim. He's segueing right there. Our, our business meeting is one week later. It's going to take place on the 1st of November. I'm just letting you know it's being delayed a week, and so I am giving you that reminder so you know that. Again, Faith Bible Institute, letting you know registration is now open. You might be interested in registering for that. It would be the least expensive college credit class you ever took. And you go, oh, it's less expensive. It must not be worth much. No, it is really incredibly, incredibly good. Uh, there, And if you do, don't want to take that from me, take that from a dozen Faith Bible Institute graduates that are in our church who can tell you what a wonderful thing it is. Take it from those who graduated, and they're taking it again just because. They just want to review and hear more about it. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Okay, this very, very important tiny little document is called a Berean Baptist Church directory card. And you say, Pastor, I filled one of these out last year. And I go, I know. But if you haven't filled one out this year, we want you to fill one out again because we just got to make sure that all our details are correct. Or you go, Pastor, I have not filled one of these out at all, well, then you're the one who needs to. And so Brother Clint has extras of these. We're trying to get a new director out in time for the holidays. Is there anybody, and you need another one of these, because, uh, because uh, Dave Saxter is absolutely convinced that some in our congregation have the spiritual gift of procrastination, <laughs> because some of you have not got this in yet, and he really does need it so he can do his work. So anyway, just want to let you know uh, to be able to get that in if you can. Okay, that is enough announcements and pronouncements right now, and Brother Jim Grew is going to lead us in a couple more songs. All right, let's take our hymn books in number 197, God Leads Us Along. 197.
I'm sure glad to serve a God who is able rather than a God who is unable. Yeah. Understand, I, you know, this will sound crazy, but about 20 years ago, I was in a church, 25 years ago, I was in a church, and, you know, you know, deacons, by the way, they're there to support the pastor. But 25 years ago, I was in a church that had a deacon where he believed God could do anything on Sunday, and he believed God could do nothing on Monday. And so that was a fun place to be. But and the thing is, is that God is able to do so much. God is able to speak to you tonight, and I think that's an important thing. So please turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 27. Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale. It's going to be something similar to that. Uh, we are going boating tonight, and uh, we are looking at uh, a real-life Christian example of a real-life person who is on a real-life boat. And he had something to say when he was on the boat. And there is, uh, it's important to understand this, and that is there are places in Scripture where a particular event exists and God gives lots of details. And then there's places where it's an event and God gives no details whatsoever. And it's time for you to ask why. Why did God want all these details given where in other situations God gave no details? And there's a reason for that. And you really do need to pursue the reason because God wrote the scriptures on purpose. And so sometimes there's an example and you just have to look at it for a while to see what will jump out at you. Something jumped out at me, and I'm going to share that with you. Acts chapter 27, we are looking at verse 5, and by way of context, I want you to realize that God is in the process of getting the Apostle Paul to Rome. Now, does anybody know geometry here? Let me ask you a question. The shortest distance between two points is, help me out, wow, nobody's answering here. Go ahead, Facebook section, go ahead. A straight line. A straight line, thank you very much. If you look at this passage, it's not a straight line. But God is in it getting the two points together. Let's start at verse 5. We're starting kind of the middle of the trip, but an important location on the journey here. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. And you may go, Pastor, why do we need to know all these details? I'll tell you what. All of these details in Scripture you can find on a map. You find Bible times. You literally can Google Earth, zoom in per se, and you can see right where these people were at different points in time. And you're going to learn a whole lot about there is a time where you can go sailing pretty easily on the Great Lakes, and there's another time where you do not want to be in the water in the Great Lakes at a certain time of year. That is also entirely true about the Mediterranean Sea. So let's look here. And when we had sailed slowly many days and scarce were come over against um, Nidus, the wind not suffering us. That means the wind was not allowing us to go the direction we wanted to go. We sailed under Crete over against uh, Salmon and hardly passing it came unto the place which is called the Fair Havens. Nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Now when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master 
and the owner of the ship, more than those things which were spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Finis and there to winter, which is an haven of Crete, and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Euroclidon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps, undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, strike sail, and were so driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship, and the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. But now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. The title of tonight's message is called Earning an Audience. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray now that you would use your word in each one of our hearts in a practical manner. There are many of us here and we have burdens tonight. We have burdens for our loved ones. And we have burdens for our co-workers. And we have burdens for friends. And we earnestly desire that they would hear the truth of your word. And so we pray, Lord, that you would embark us on a process and help us to be patient in the process. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Let me ask you this question. Did you ever have the right answer, but no one was listening? Anybody ever have that happen to you? You know you have the right answer, but nobody is listening. Ever happened to you? Anybody at all? Anybody at all? Okay, several of you here. Okay, and it may be because you're not in a supervisory role or it may be because maybe in this case, maybe you're a child and you have an adult answer, but they're not expecting that from you. But, uh, but anyway, or it may be because you're an adult, but mom and dad are an older adult. So that happens there. These things happen to us, and this is an important thing. Ever have the right answer, but no one is listening. This is especially true regarding the gospel. If you're saved here tonight, you already know you have the right answer. But you might discover that getting somebody else to listen to you is a bit of a challenge. And part of the reason it may be a challenge is there is a process that has to take place very often before somebody will listen. I mean, let's face it, you feel this way. You know, since I'm so obviously right, 
and they're so obviously wrong and they should just listen to us right away. But that's not what happens. And so I want you to think about this. There is a process to go through, which on the other side of the process, there will be a divine opportunity and there will be a listening ear. And the process is found in this passage. And so we are going to talk about this passage. We're going to talk about earning an audience. I'm going to give you three practical points that I want you to think about. And then there's going to be some items that exist in the middle of this that I want you to know about. So let's start at the very beginning. And I want you to think about this statement here. Sometimes people are not ready for the message you have. You need to think about this. Sometimes people are not ready for the message you have. Now, those of you who got saved very, very young, you didn't necessarily have this experience because you were a child, you got saved as a child, you may not even have remembered that you had the message before. But those of you, on the other hand, who are maybe saved at an older age, you may have heard the message before, but you just simply were not ready for it. Uh, maybe you thought the person giving you the message was an oddball, you know, kind of like this cartoon character named Bill the Cat who had one eyeball bigger than the other. Or, you know, maybe it was that situation, um, or it was very, very new information for you. You're going, I've never heard anything like that. Could that really be true? Sometimes people are not ready for the message you have. And I want to point this out by looking at this passage. Let's start in verse 10. And it says, Paul admonished them. So Paul had something to say. Paul had something important to say. And what Paul had to say was right. But here's what we go. And he said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and with much damage, not only of the lading of the ship, but also of our lives. Apply that to the gospel. There was one man who said, We will spend more time in our lives soul warning than we will soul winning. We are trying to help people understand that there is an existence of sin. There's the existence of a sin condition. There's an existence of sin's consequence. And it's a terrible consequence. But sometimes they just simply do not want to hear the warning. And so we're dealing with that. They're not ready for the message you have. Now, there can be reasons why they're not listening. Verse 11 may give you some reasons. Nevertheless, this centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things that were spoken of by Paul. And sometimes people are not ready for the message you have because somebody else has their ear. And I want, you to, I want to paint the picture. Okay, over here on this side, I have Paul. And Paul is dressed in, a, in uh, some kind of coat or some kind of cloak, but there's a difference. He's also in shackles. And that's the Apostle Paul. So the Apostle Paul is bound. The Apostle Paul is tied up. The Apostle Paul is incarcerated. The Apostle Paul is a prisoner. And the Apostle Paul is trying to warn the centurion that there is trouble ahead. But over here on this side is the captain of the boat. And the captain of the boat has 20 years experience. The captain of the boat has the sailor's hat. The captor of the boat is a merchant. The captor of the boat is known as a man of the sea. And so you've got the centurion. He goes, do I listen to the prisoner in shackles or do I listen to the captain of the boat? What do you think the centurion did? He listened to the captain of the boat. And the reality is, is sometimes you have to spend some time earning the respect of an individual before they'll listen to you at all. Sometimes a person's ear will be on another person because either in the ranking system that you're in at work or where you're at, they seem to be of a higher rank, or at least they talk like they're of a higher rank. One of those things are taking place. 
So, sometimes people are not ready for the message you have. Uh, they don't want to heed your warning because somebody else has their ear. And then further is this. The circumstances seem to point a different direction. Look with me what it says here. Because the haven was not commodious to winter in. And so what you have here is Paul saying, don't take the boat out because it's very, very dangerous. But the people are saying there is not a good harbor on this island. And so if storms hit this island, there's not a good place to moor our boat. Our boat could get damaged in this harbor. And then furthermore, it says, the moor part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Fennis and there to winter, which is in the haven of Crete, and live toward the southwest and northwest. And they're going, there's a better harbor. Let's get to that better harbor because we can lash our boat down there. We can harbor in that one. We're protected from the storms. There's a lot less chance to damage the boat. So all of these things are very practical, by the way. So sometimes people won't listen to you because the circumstances of their life seem to be pointing in a different direction. And so they're not listening to you. They're not listening to your warning because everything seems to be somewhat positive their way and then maybe even get more positive. Look here. It says initially their decision seems justified. Look at verse 13. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they have obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. So here's what happened. All of a sudden, the wind began blowing, not hard, but softly. All of the conditions seemed to be favorable to the way they were thinking. I'm going to ask you a hard question. I want you to think about this. Does God bless lost people? He does. Remember, the Bible says that God rains the rain on the just and the unjust alike. So God blesses lost people as well. And sometimes when lost people are going through good circumstances, for some reason they just don't seem to be as interested in hearing about the warning. And so understand, we're going through a process here. And so sometimes people are not ready for the message you have because of all these things, somebody, what they say seems to be more important. They didn't like a warning. They don't understand the warning. They have an answer for their problem, and the answer seems to be working out. Wow. I shouldn't have said anything wrong. You were not wrong for declaring the message. God will use it later. So don't ever think, okay, in that situation, I shouldn't have said anything. No, you were right to say it. Just don't get discouraged if you don't get the response you're looking for and understand it's all part of the process. God will use it later. So that's point number one. Sometimes... People are not ready for the message you have. Point number two. This is a hard one. Human hope must be abandoned before divine hope will be accepted. I want you to think about that. Human hope must be abandoned before divine hope will be accepted. When you go home tonight, uh, I, I have to tell you this. I want you to be very concerned about this. There is an enemy in your home. And that enemy will be hard to find. And so the enemy in your home usually is in the bathroom. I want you to know that. The enemy in your home is usually in the bathroom. And so when you get home, go into your bathroom and turn on the light. And look in the mirror. 
you found him. Because the enemy in your home is usually you. And the problem that we see in this process is these folks are fighting enemies and it's usually them. And understand in our own humanity, we like to think we have the answers. And we like to think that we have hope. We like to think that we can create hope. We like to think that we can make our plans. And by the way, because you made the plan, you already know it's perfect, don't you? You made the plan. So you know it's absolutely right because you made it. Just because you did. Okay? And you know, and then if it turns out your plan is wrong, well, that's okay. You've got, it's somebody else's fault. Okay? Look what Adam did. The woman whom thou gave me. I had a perfect plan. It's her fault. Okay? Or it's somebody else's fault. It's a, my parents' fault. Okay? It's my children's fault. It's my employer's fault. It's somebody's fault. Not my fault. Human hope must be abandoned before divine hope will be accepted. Look at verse 14. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocliden, or it could be Eurocliden. Um, put your emphasis on whatever syllable you want to. But we have this reality here. All of a sudden, there is a major storm. Now, let me tell you something. When they name storms, you know it is a problem. You see, the bad storms, we name them. This storm is named, so you know it's a bad storm. So we're dealing with this. What is the point? This. There is a consistency to consequences. In other words, consequences happen in a people's lives, and there is a consistency to it. If a person consistently goes 20 miles an hour over the speed limit in Pendleton, Oregon, there is a chance that Pendleton's finest may eventually pull them over and counsel them. It may happen. Now, they, they may counsel them for free. More likely, they're going to charge a counseling fee for counseling them in the city. There is a consistency in consequences. If you have too much month at the end of the money and you decide that you're going to go to a payday loan company. Eventually, you will discover there's consistency to consequences because now they have all your money and every time payday shows up, they're going to want your money again. And so there's a consistency to certain consequences that happen in life and sometimes... We're hard nuts to crack. Sometimes it takes us a while to realize, hey, you know what? I did that before, and it had the same result. In the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. That is the definition of insanity. So there's a consistency to consequences. Look at verses 15 through 20. And when the ship was caught... And could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. It is better to let a ship go where it wants to than try to get the ship to go a different direction and have the ship be torn apart. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by by the boat. It means everybody was running around just trying to keep the boat together, to keep the masts from falling down, to keep the everything from ripping apart. In which, when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship. What did he mean by helps undergirding the ship? Here's the interesting thing. Back in those days with wooden ships, they had extra ropes. And what they would literally do is wrap those ropes around the boat and tie those ropes and tie them tightly in multiple locations to hold the ship together. Because if they didn't, that ship was going to shake itself apart and so they literally they wrapped the boat with extra ropes uh, now we don't you do it ropes anymore we have something in our day and age called Alabama chrome okay that is duct tape and we wrap things with duct tape when we want those things to hold together that's what we do and so it says this undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands strike sail and so were driven and we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lighten the ship, and the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. This is very, very bad news. 
Because what it says is we have now tossed out of everything out of the boat that was the extra equipment we needed to hold the boat together. Because we're afraid we have too much on the boat and the boat is going to fall apart if we have too much on the boat. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. So it's understanding. By the way, at this point you understand you, the author of the book of Acts is Luke the physician. And Luke the physician was a scientific man, but Luke the physician was also a pragmatic man and he's reporting the morale of the crew on the boat. And the morale is not very good. They're all looking at each other going, we are going to die. And it's only a matter of time. A divine answer becomes an option when human efforts are exhausted. You know, it's like that, uh, that snarky tenor in the choir that would say to me at the church in Beaver Creek, Oregon, and I'd say it two minutes before service, and I'd say, okay, guys, get together, it's time to pray, and he would always say, has it come to that? And, you know, what he is saying is saying, and many of us, we don't like to think that, but we're often that way. We're trying to solve our own problem. And after we have exhausted every option that we have, okay, I guess we better ask God what to do. And we have that. And this is really what had happened to these people. You're trying to earn an audience. You want to give the gospel. But I want you to understand that that sometimes has to happen in an individual's life before they're ready to listen. And listen, I don't want anything bad to happen to anybody. But sometimes things like this are necessary if somebody is ever going to listen to God. And we don't like to admit this, sometimes ourselves included. And so we have this. So once that happens, it's time to say something. Look at verse 21. But after long abstinence. Now what does the word abstinence mean? It means that after that time, when Paul tried to say, you shouldn't do this, they said, no, we're going to do this. He went, okay. And all this is going on for days, maybe weeks, and Paul is saying nothing. Now, if you were to look at him, he might have a bloody lip. He's biting it till it bleeds. But he is saying absolutely nothing because he knows it's not time to say anything. Now he's going to say something. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. Okay? How many... Now, let's summarize what the Apostle Paul just said. Can somebody say what the Apostle Paul said in just four words? Okay, right here. I told you so. That's what's going on right here. He's saying it in four words. He's saying it more eloquently, but he's saying, I told you so. But don't declare just the bad news. Declare the bad news and the good news. What's the gospel? The gospel is good news. Declare both the bad news and the good news. And it says, and now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God. Now, I find this very, very interesting because I want you to notice the wording here. Take a careful look. The angel of God, whose I am and whom I am, I serve. Now there are some that believe, and I haven't totally researched this out, some believe because it didn't say an angel of God, but it said the angel of God, that this may have been a post-resurrection appearance of Jesus Christ himself. Now I'm not going to be 
super 100% dogmatic on that, but I want you to know that some people think that just because of the wording of it. And here's what the message is, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. So here's what we have. We have the bad news and we have the good news. There is a time to speak. There is a time when you will earn an audience. There is a time to give an answer. It wasn't wrong for you to give an answer the first time. You just noticed nobody was listening. And at that point you go, okay, bide your time. Bite your lip. Another opportunity is coming. A more favorable opportunity is coming. And when it comes, declare both the bad news means repeat the warning. And then give the good news. There is a God who cares and is watching. And then with that, declare your faith. As the Bible says, wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God. Declare your faith at that time. It's more than having the right answer. It's also letting them know, and not only do I have the right answer, I live the right answer. I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. And so we have this reality here, declare your faith. So we're two out of three here. Again, reviewing. Sometimes people, they're not ready for the message you have. And I realize that can be a frustrating spot. You know, there are some people that I know with all my heart, I want them to be saved more than they want to. Have you noticed that? But see, human hope must be abandoned before divine hope will be accepted. So once you have the audience, be a source of truth and be a source of encouragement. Look now at verse 30. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Now remember, the centurion, remember, prisoner, captain. Prisoner, captain. I'm going to listen to the captain. Now it's captain, prisoner. Captain, prisoner. Who I'm going to listen to? The prisoner. Something has changed here. Paul has earned an audience, and so look what happened here. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. What was happening is all of the shipmen on the boat are going, hey guys, abandoned ship. And they're trying to sneak off the boat. Paul told the truth. The centurion at this point, Paul during the centurion's audience said, hey guys, get rid of the lifeboat. They cut off the lifeboat. So, important to understand, understand that God will only do a miracle his way. That's an important statement. By the way, this is the crux of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nobody can get to heaven another way. God can only do the miracle his way. And if there's an application here, it's understanding. God plans to do a miracle, but he's going to do it his way, and there's not another way to do it. So we have that. So then also look at this, verse 33 and 34. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the 14th day ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. How many here in this room say, oh yeah, I'd love to go without a meal for 14 days? Okay. How many of you say two or three is enough? Okay. Two or three is enough. Okay. 14 days. Man, 14 days, that'd be an eternity for you guys. Okay. You, you wouldn't die from it, but you'd sound like you were dying by day two. So, we have that here. It says, I pray you to take some meat, for this is and th for this is for your health. And look at this promise here. For there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And you know, for some of you, that might not mean a whole lot. But for a person like me, that's very, very encouraging. And so we have this reality here. 
encourage them in a practical manner. Then, this is very important, verse 35. Understand, God's in the details. Look at verse 35. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread, catch his next phrase, and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. Did you catch that? It's one thing to earn an audience, but it's another thing then to earn the respect of God. And here, Paul may have volunteered a prayer or somebody may have asked him to pray. I worked for a secular company in, um, I worked for a secular company in Portland, Oregon. I worked for the central maintenance office of a very, very large property management company. Then our entire maintenance office got sold to an upstart company. I was in that upstart company. I was in year two. They had the company picnic. And I showed up after, by the way, having driven a thousand miles worth of inspections up from Portland to Medical Lake to Republican Washington, which is almost the Canadian border, all the way back, got there just in time for the company picnic. And the president of the company said, could you please pray and bless the meal? This is important. It takes a while to earn an audience. And so we have that. And so he gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Credit God for his work. When God's at work, be sure to give God the credit for what God is doing. Then look at verse 36. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. Understand, God's work will show up in the countenance of the converted. And that is when somebody has made the turn, you have all of a sudden, you have an audience, and they've accepted your message. It's going to show in their countenance and on their faces that you, they have accepted the message that you have. And then look at verse 37. Why would we care? And we were in all in the ship 200, three score, and 16 souls. 276 saved. Did you catch that? There are 276 on the boat, and they're going to be saved. Now, granted, we know that they were saved here in a human sense. We know they were saved in the divine sense that God saved their human lives. But I want you to understand there's a process to this. And there's a process to the gospel. And, and I would say this because I'm an independent fundamental Baptist. Sometimes we're just a wee too much impatient. And we don't give enough time for somebody to be saved. And the reality is we are not witnesses for a day or a month or a week. We are witnesses for a lifetime. And sometimes it will take a whole lot longer than you would want it to, to earn an audience. But it's a case where we have to be patient and you have to bide your time and never ever think that God is not at work because God is always at work. And it takes a while for things to come along. This passage is an object lesson of the gospel. A message that is not regarded until God does a work in a person or people's lives. Then you earn an audience. Then you're able to give a message you're able to declare your faith and you see the change, the transformation that happens on people as they become saved. Final verse, not in the book of Acts. Also written by the Apostle Paul, by the way. I think he had some experience and God used him through the power of the Holy Spirit for this one verse, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap. 
Do you believe that word? We say we believe whosoever calleth on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You took that step of faith. Do you believe in this step of faith? In due season we shall reap if we faint not. We don't give up. We don't become impatient. And we let God work out his divine process. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we look into your word today and we see the practicality of your word tonight. And I come to the realization, Lord, that when you provide details, those details are there for a reason. And Lord, we saw a ship full of sailors become a ship full of converts. A ship full of people that trusted in a human captain become a ship full of people that trusted in a spiritual captain. Lord, help us to be patient and help us to be faithful and continue on with your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. And as we look, the song is number 159. 159, we'll stand as we sing. And the song is very simple in terms of Jesus, I come to thee. I particularly like one of these verses as we look at this here. I like the one that says, out of life storms and into thy calm. Jesus, I come to thee. If you have a need, maybe you have a burden for an individual and you're just about ready to run out of patience with that particular individual. Don't run out of patience. Bring that individual to the foot of the cross tonight and pray for them earnestly. God is at work. Let's sing this song together. <laughs>